Just as a funny aside, I wasn't planning to say this, uh, on the subject of what you might call the long campaign, actually establishing ritual and branded ritual, things that actually continue for a long time rather than obsessing about breadth and reach, uh, I came across, purely by coincidence, a perfect example of it about two days ago. Um, amongst all the Beatle-loving hippies in the room, are there any Hank Williams fans, by any chance? Ah, oh, good, excellent, one true music lover. Um, and um, the interesting thing, you'll probably know the single Hank Williams fan might know the song The Pan American, which is about a train, like well, most good songs, frankly, are about trains, particularly about those trains which the Americans had the good sense to name because you can actually sing about a train that has a name in a sense that you can't really sing about, you know, the 427 from Paddington in the same way. And the Pan American was a train which actually left Cincinnati every day uh, to um, uh, head in down that Dixie line uh, and went to New Orleans. And it was famous for its punctuality and reliability. And as the Hank Williams song actually records, it says that uh, it, it leaves Cincinnati heading down that Dixie line. When it passes that Nashville tower, you can hear that whistle whine. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the Nashville tower was actually the broadcasting station of uh, WSM, which was the, uh, as, as the single country fan in the room will know, uh, was the great broadcasting station of the Nashville Opry and broadcast to basically the whole of the American South, uh, a healthy diet of country music. What was beautiful about this was that as a model and pure demonstration of the reliability of the train, the train used to whistle every time it went past the radio station and the radio station broadcast the whistle. So the American South used to set its watch by this train going past uh, WSM uh, as it was broadcasting the Louisiana Hayride. Uh, WSM was in turn, by the way, an advertising a kind of branded station because it was sponsored by an insurance company and WSM stood for We Shield Millions. So uh, interesting case, I think, of a fantastic long now, uh, immortalized, in fact, by, uh, by Hank Williams. Um, you know, good, good, good. There's one bloody fan here, honestly. God, what's, what's happening? But uh, I tried to replicate the thing um, uh, unconsciously, not knowing about this story, uh, when Disney started running trains from uh, uh, Waterloo to uh, Disneyland Paris, I tried to get the trains to play the first two bars of uh, When You Wish Upon a Star uh, every day as they left Waterloo, and was told that, well, would this, would this actually annoy people in South London? I replied, yes, and, and at no extra cost. Um, uh, and um, uh, and uh, <laughs> The reason the thing finally failed was actually we discovered that, rather bizarrely, Disney didn't actually own the rights to the song When You Wish Upon a Star, which is a slightly peculiar case of, uh, of, uh, of rather bad rights management, if I may say so. But what I'm going to talk about here is a kind of rap. And I've called it It's Time We Lost Our Sense of Proportion. Gert might like this. I think it was Willy Brandt who said um, uh, the, of the Germans that the God gave the Germans all the virtues except a sense of proportion. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm quite a fan of losing a sense of proportion. And I'm using this as an interesting argument against, a part argument against the kind of obsession with numerology in marketing that we developed a business culture that it finds it absolutely impossible to justify or explain or promulgate any business opinion or view or approach unless it has numerical backing. Now, that's not always bad. You know, I like you know, the application of science in large areas of business. Um, when, for example, I fly on a plane, I don't want to think that the people who check the wheel nuts for British Airways are desperately creative people. You know, I don't want a bunch of people going around going, let's try anti-clockwise this time just for laughs, okay? At the same time, the obsession with methodology and the idea that nothing that is um, unaccompanied by a spreadsheet can have any validity at all is, I think, a dangerously poisoning influence uh, to business. And there are times where instead of going along with the prevailing obsession with a kind of accountancy, um, that actually I think marketing should fight back. I think there are times when we should actually play along, but I think what marketers have developed is a kind of Stockholm syndrome, where we've been so beaten up by procurement and finance and other people that we've started to take on the worst qualities of our abusers. And um, I think there are occasionally times when we should actually fight back. And one of the things I've discovered in this search is that there is actually quite a respectable intellectual and scientific tradition of questioning numbers. Uh, one of the first times I became aware of this complete discrepancy was in watching Deal or No Deal with a friend of mine who works for Goldman Sachs. And I suddenly realized that his approach to Deal or No Deal was fairly different to mine. 
And he believed absolutely unshakably that he was effectively playing it the right way because he simply looked at what the optimal outcome was. And therefore, unless the bank actually offered you something that was better than you might expect uh, through normal uh, you know, uh, chance and statistics, then you should obviously refuse the bank's offer. What's interesting about that is virtually everybody in the finance world would assume that was the correct way to play and would regard the actual behavior of the real contestants as fundamentally irrational or wrong. Now, what's interesting about that, however, is if you look a little bit deeper, it may partly be that if you work for Goldman Sachs, you earn such huge amounts of money that actually what you might win on dole, deal or no deal actually is irrelevant anyway. But in this case, in this case, my friend had actually left and was no longer working. But what was interesting, implicit in that assumption or contained in that assumption uh, or contained in that, that absolutely confident assertion that actually, uh, you know, what you should do is play the odds, are a few, st a few assumptions which are completely at odds with true human nature. First of all, it completely fails to account for re regret, the pain of long-term regret, that if you have one chance in your entire life to go on a game show, you're offered £20,000, you say no, and you walk away with a fiver. You do spend the next 30 years of your life feeling like a twat, okay? <laughs> And it is worth taking a certain degree of loss to ensure against that um, contingency, okay? But the second thing that's interesting in the assumption of the Goldman Sachs player, or, you know, the hyper-rational player of Deal or No Deal, is actually that £20,000 is twice as good as £10,000. Actually, if you look at all the evidence of human hedonics, that's not true that actually money has a diminishing marginal utility, and actually a £20,000 caravan is not twice as good as a £10,000 caravan. That by and large, actually, the way these people play their, this game, which is almost looking at numbers in a logarithmic way rather than in a proportionate way, is probably vastly more in keeping with the relationship between money and happiness than the absolutely linear relationship posited by the person working in finance. So their sensible thing, which is actually, you know, a reasonable chance of 10 grand is better than an outside chance of 20, is actually probably right and, to some degree, rational, or at least, if not rational, sensible. Whereas the linear relationship assumed by the banker playing that game is actually not in keeping with, with uh, uh, human pleasure. Now, that, that, that is one really interesting thing about all numbers. I'll come to this in a second, which is that numbers dangerously suggest to the statistically um, less than astute that all things must have some sort of linear relationship. Whereas actually in reality, the odds are anything involving human psychology, they're not. I'll give you one fantastic example of this assumption of linearity, which is call centers for years used to compete on the, on the duration it took to answer a call. And they decide that actually if it was average of three rings, this was actually, you know, twice as good as six rings. And they assumed there was a kind of linear relationship and they rewarded and incentivized people accordingly. What they discovered was that two rings people thought was pretty damn good. Anything up to ten rings was fine and over ten rings they started to get angry. But there was no linear relationship, uh, in, uh, there was no gain whatsoever in spending thousands of, of pounds getting the answer time down from eight rings to three and yet they assumed a kind of linearity there, and this is dangerously assumed in everything where numerical metrics actually kick in. Uh, the power of numerical metrics is, of course, um, exaggerated if you look at the actual functional background. We were talking about board diversity earlier. Uh, the UK ha has this to a more extreme degree than any other country in the world, the extent to which finance guys uh, dominate uh, boards and particularly the CEO's chair. Not surprising because the shareholder value movement basically means that being a CEO spends, I mean, involves spending 80% of your time talking to 23-year-olds at Deutsche Bank explaining why your EBITDA is 2% down on projection. And when you're facing nine guys in rimless specs at Deutsche Bank, it's better to have a finance background than a marketing background, to be absolutely honest, because they're not the kind of guys who like, yeah, well, never mind that, but have you seen my mood board? Um, <laughs> but... But the over-preponderance, the over-preponderance of this kind of, this kind of skill base is also dangerous. I'm um, going to play a quick game now, spot the terrorist. Uh, here are five faculties at a university, and you've got to guess where all the, all the fundamentalist terrorists come from. Okay? Now, it, actually, Islamic studies comes a very, very distant second. Easily top engineering, spot on. 
Absolutely right. Uh, in fact, to an alarming and statistically absolutely peculiar degree. Um, and here we go, build a bomber. Why do so many terrorists have engineering degrees? Um, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, uh, Mohammed Atta was an architectural engineer, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed got a degree in mechanical engineering, two of the three founders of Lakshar e Taibi uh, behind the Mumbai attacks were actually professors at the University of, uh, of Engineering and Technology in Lahore. And these two sociologists asked this question. And at one point it was, it was debated, well, actually, do you need engineering skills to blow things up? And they actually discovered, well, many of these people were actually in management roles and weren't actually involved in bomb preparation at all. Um, and actually, in any case, the Bader Meinhof did a pretty good job of blowing things up, and they were bloody arts graduates to a man, you know. Um, you know, good humanities students, you know, all of them. Now, so they actually looked a bit deeper, and then what they actually decided, there's a peculiar mindset among engineers that disdains ambiguity and compromise. Um, so they bought that actually the whole compromise, the ambiguity of life is deeply uncomfortable to these people. So they seek absolutist or fundamentalist viewpoints as a natural concomitant of your study of engineering. Because it drives a kind of mechanistic view of life which is actually uncomfortable with, with fluffiness, fudginess or imprecision. A very interesting thing, Karl Popper made the remark that actually most things in life sit, sit on a spectrum between clouds and clocks, between meteorology and perfect clockwork engineering. His, his other claim was that most of the worst mistakes that are made in life is treating things that are like clouds as though they were clocks. Um, now, so this is an interesting case, interesting, uh, this is just an extra thing that actually uh, as British intelligence picked out that actually they specifically targeted engineers for this peculiar mindset. They could actually look at the, you know, the boards of directors of quite a large number of British companies, I suspect, uh, which would have the same amb you know, hatred of ambiguity. But actually, if you want to occasionally fight back against this obsession with you know, a kind of numerology, a kind of you know, you know, fetishization of, of, of numerical values, you do have some interesting uh, intellectual antecedents. Uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, is one of them. Uh, the uh, Austrian economic school are absolutely disdained by other economists because on a point of principle they refuse to use maths. Their claim is that they believe that actually numbers are wholly inadequate for the representation of human preference. And therefore since economics has to be all about human preference, it's completely wrong to use numbers to actually in economics and they use thought experiments instead. This actually came from a bumper sticker in the United States. I searched on Google Images and was slightly freaked to discover there are people who are so keen on the Austrian School of Economics in the States that they buy bumper stickers saying, Ludwig von Mises is my hero. Um, there's a quite an interesting area of wit, just as an aside, uh, in, in bumper stickers, uh, including the, the, the best example of in, to its, in its defense of neo-Nazi humor I've ever come across, which is quite a lot of fundamentalist Christians started putting bumper stickers on their cars that said, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. And these got more and more common. And a bunch of neo-Nazis retaliated with, my boss is an Austrian painter, which I had to admit was kind of quite funny. I mean, you know, I, was, I wasn't expecting that one, put it that way. But Ludwig von Mises actually basically makes the assertion that numbers, because human preference is ordinal and not scalar, and not, um, it is completely wrong to depict human preference in numerical terms. Um, another interesting person who is also um, demands that numbers be treated with some skepticism is a chap called Goodhart. Anybody know him? Still alive, the, um, uh, effectively the begetter of the eponymous Goodhart's Law. Um, Goodhart's Law, expressed by him, he was a treasury economist, so uh, it was slightly verbose description. His actual law, as better expressed in a condensed form, is that any metric that becomes a target loses its value as a metric. That the second something becomes specifically pursued, its value as a useful metric has disappeared. Hospital waiting lists would have been a perfect case in point because once that became the metric du jour, everybody just developed ways of effectively distorting the figures. Um, airline punctuality, if you've ever noticed your plane occasionally pushes back and then you just go for a drive around the airport for 25 minutes, that's because actually airline departure time I think is measured from pushback. Uh, railway companies would cancel trains for the simple reason that a train that doesn't exist can't actually be late. Um, but in many, many cases, once you actually take a metric and make it a target, its value, its informational value is more or less completely destroyed. Um, and finally, a guy called Cooperthwaite, a brilliant, brilliant economist responsible for the policy of positive non-intervention um, in the e economy of Hong Kong. 
He was the guy who turned up with the brief to improve the Hong Kong economy and decided that since it was doing pretty well without him, his actual policy was to do nothing at all. But he took this to such a beautiful extreme that he actually forbade the collection of economic statistics for fear that the existence of economic statistics might encourage people to do things. And that the second you have in statistics, it will only encourage people to interfere. And so he actually forbade the collection of statistics on those grounds. And the final example, this is not a picture of Einstein, it's a picture of Princeton, where Einstein's office was. Uh, there's a weird creative rule that you can't show pictures of Einstein because you get thrown out of the creative trade union for cliches. Uh, so I had to show a picture of, 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 uh, of Princeton. <laughs> and um, he supposedly had above his desk, although opinions differ, a sign that said, not everything that, can be, uh, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Opinions do differ on this. Most people claim that was what, what was above his desk, although there's a small dissenting group who say there was a sign that says, said, you don't have to be mad here to work here, but it helps. Uh, another sign that said, quick, look busy, here comes the boss. And uh, a picture of a girl playing tennis with no knickers on. But I, I, I prefer the first theory, personally. Um, but that's quite an important point, that actually, are you obsessing about these things simply because they present themselves easy, easily in numerical form? when actually to the consumer or to the human being, they're not very important at all. Uh, train punctuality is another case which is not unimportant, but which is pursued with linear obsession to a point where it is meaningless to the average train passenger. If you are four minutes late getting into London and that upsets your whole day, well, frankly, that's not the train company's problem, that's your problem. Or I suppose you might be Swiss or something. But, um, <laughs> Um, but actually, you know, this is pursued to a point of absolute absurdity, whereas far more important measures like how enjoyable and pleasant is your journey and is there a table, because they don't submit to the same uh, regular generation of numerical stats, those things get completely neglected. The whole point of rail travel is that there's a table. That is why you have trains, because it's the only form of transport where you can actually read, work, have a laptop and treat it like an office. Okay? So the idea that actually all the effort and money is being spent making the thing two minute, arrive two minutes earlier, while at the same time some other guy is ripping out the tables, is exactly the kind of problem where atrocious metrics lead to a massive destruction of real economic value. The other problem is that people tend to look at numbers, as I said, with this assumption of proportionality. Now, an awful lot of human behavior isn't proportionate like that. This is the effect you can have simply by changing a tiny wording of a sentence on the number of people who enroll for um, organ donation in Europe. Now, you know, the engineering mentality would say, well, actually, it will cost you millions of pounds to achieve that sign of thing. What's beautiful about marketing is precisely that it's disproportionate. Sometimes the glorious thing about marketing is the effect a very small intervention can have huge effects. And that, when you think about it, is much more interesting. But if you obsess about numbers and you obsess about clocks, not clouds, what you tend to assume, erroneously, is you obsess about the idea that proportionate inputs are required for a certain level of change. Here are really, really trivial little things where tiny little details have huge effects. I would say that the reason video conferencing and telepresence have largely failed in the marketplace is simply a framing effect. They're always positioned as the poor man's air travel rather than the rich man's phone call. Uh, it was a disastrous, a perfectly logical positioning, absolutely sensible. You, you portrayed the thing on cost savings. Unfortunately, what you made it was is, is the form of business interaction for people who can't be trusted to get on a plane. It was a bit like the pager to the mobile phone, margarine to butter, you know the kind of thing. It was the inferior substitute for when you couldn't afford the real thing. So we don't really trust you, Sutherland, to go to Frankfurt because you'd only get pissed and raid the minibar. But tell you what, you could go down to a basement room in your office and have a very pixelated conversation with Jürgen for 25 minutes. <laughs> OK? That's a framing effect. Equally. The other thing you've got to be spectacularly alert to about anything involving human psychology is that, as I said, the, the frame of reference can very, very suddenly change. You're there, you're looking at all your numbers, you're making a lot of money, and then suddenly the paradigm shifts. Now, one of the reasons you absolutely need really good human understanding and that the balance sheet does not provide this is this happens. This is basically a very expensive hi-fi. All of us who are over 40 can remember all of our friends buying expensive hi-fis and having interminable conversations about sound reproduction. 
and they'd all say, and I've bought these speaker cables, which are 10 pounds per foot and hand-woven by elves, okay? And I've bought this really expensive Nakamishi so-and-so. Suddenly, the iPod came along, and suddenly went, actually, MP3, the sound quality is a bit shit, but you can get 5,000 songs in a little box. And the entire paradigm within the space of about three months changed from sound reproduction and the perfection of sound reproduction to portability and convenience. McDonald's did the same thing, effectively. Everybody assumed the American diner was about choice. You know, you had eggs in six ways, over easy, sunny side up, substitutions of one kind of sausage for another sausage, and McDonald's came along and said, no, it's not, it's about speed. We'll cut the menu down to six items and we'll prepare them so fast there's no delay. That you're always, that bear in mind that in, in every business, the paradigms and the units of, of, of measure by which people make comparisons are actually subject to very, very rapid and unpredictable change. So actually understanding as a business what is the current measure of value in your business, but what it might be, is a vital marketing function. And this is where the enormous and absolutely unpredictable effects can some, sometimes take place. So this is the final little plea, uh, Trim Tab, which I think is a, is a little model for all marketing thinking. What he believed in looking for was the absolute opposite of proportionality. He called himself Trim Tab because the Trim Tab is the little bit on a boat or plane where the smallest movement has the biggest effect on the direction of the craft. And that was, his, that was always his vision in seeking solutions. If you obsess about numbers, you will suddenly become preoccupied with a kind of mechanistic view of the world where things by and large happen in proportion. What's joyful about marketing, although admittedly, and I'm free to admit it, comes at the price sometimes of unpredictability, but what is really valuable about marketing is it offers the potential for those trim tab moments where one very, very small intervention can have absolutely massive effects. That's both to your advantage and to your detriment. But the vital thing to remember is that if you are purely looking at the health of your business, as most boards of directors are doing now in numerical and financial terms, you are missing a huge area of where value both resides, might be created, or indeed might be destroyed. I mentioned that paradigm shift from Delena Meadows before. But I'll end with a very, very strange hero, having mentioned Ludwig Morton Mises, which is actually watch Top Gear, because although, to be honest, he is, you know, a, you know easy, an easy target for parody and has developed, has developed a certain form of presentation, you know, to, which is almost close to, you know, very easy to parody and almost close to cliché, what Clarkson does when he reviews virtually every car is to make an extraordinarily valuable point to the marketer, which is on almost every occasion he will make the point that the numerical metrics representing this car are very good or very bad, but his emotional reaction to the thing is entirely different. So you'll say this car is slower than, worse at accelerating, worse at cornering, and actually is more expensive to buy than that car, but I prefer it. He might equally do the same thing the other way around. It's cheaper, it's faster, but I can't stand it. What, he did, what he's doing there is actually a very, very valuable point, which is making the point that quite a lot of what humans value, and I think this is back to von Mises, actually cannot be explained perfectly in numerical terms. There isn't a metric for a beautiful jug. Um, there isn't a metric for a perfect car. There isn't really a metric for the things like handling that really, you know, that are actually difficult to define but absolutely vital to our appreciation of anything. And so half of me would be very, very content for the business to become more scientific and more aligned with, you know, what we might call healthy scientific method. But actually, there's nothing unscientific against, about occasionally pushing back. And I think in all these areas, we have to look at the fact that engineers are dangerously prone to pursuing certain metrics to the point of absurdity. With mobile phones, it was miniaturization. When mobile phones were the size of a brick, it was very good to get them to fit in your pocket. Then they pursued the thing to such an insane role that actually they were so small that they disappeared into the depths of your pocket from which you couldn't retrieve them. And unless you're a Japanese schoolgirl, it was impossible to dial a number on the miniature keypad. They paid 16 billion, uh, they paid 16 billion, for example, for a 3G license, despite the fact that since the frame of reference for broadband consumption was now unmetered, they were never going to get their money back by charging mobile data by the megabyte, thereby effectively pissing billions of pounds up the wall. Okay. Equally, the Euro Tunnel, it's considered perfectly reasonable to spend £6 billion making the journey to Paris about 30 minutes faster. I was talking to the marketing director of Euro Tunnel, who said he frequently gets customers saying, that was the worst thing you ever did. I really enjoy the journey, and I can no longer relax, because it's too damn fast. 
But the fact is, there are a hundred different ways you could hedonically improve that journey with a budget of six billion, actually with half a billion, that are more effective than making it shorter, unless you're an engineer and the sum meaning of your life is looking for opportunities to stand around in a high visibility tabard pointing at things and using a theodolite. In which case, in which case I forgive you because building actually a new track is probably the best solution. But that's the vital thing. 20% of the time, maybe 30% of the time, we shouldn't get the Stockholm Syndrome. We should be unafraid to push back. Thanks very much indeed.